May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I invite the altar party to come join us here. It's on my back to you the whole time. I know, it's better to be up there. <laughs> so this is one of six times in this gospel where Jesus does something that is considered work on the Sabbath. So natural, obvious question is why? Why does he make a point of being with a group of faithful worshipers and then he stirs up some conflict? By breaking the rules. Why does he do that? That's a great question, don't you think, for those of us who are here, gathered together as a community in the name of Jesus. What is Jesus trying to get us to see? I think one of the things Jesus tries to get us as a community to see is to see with the eyes of God. Now, you all remember another story in Luke's Gospel, where he's invited to dinner by a Pharisee with a bunch of other religious leaders and some disciples. And there is a woman who sits at Jesus' feet, weeping, bathing those feet with her hair. A passionate, evocative display that causes a lot of anxiety and agitation and a lot of judgment. Jesus, sensing this, calls his disciple Simon Peter over and asks him, what I think is one of the most profound questions in the Gospels. Do you see this woman? Do you see her? In this morning's story, Jesus embodies that question, not just for one disciple, but for the whole gathered congregation. Because I can assure you, no one has seen this woman for 18 plus years. I imagine that this woman who started with something that caused her to hunch over has become the shrinking woman over those two decades. Not just because of the pain of a debilitating disease, but because everybody has shunned her. And suffering is contagious, we worry. So she is very used to being on the outskirts of community and certainly way, way back in the back of the church when it comes to Sabbath worship. But what do we hear Jesus does? We read, it says, Jesus saw her. And he doesn't see her and take note and say, come back to the healing service on Thursday. He stops what he's doing and says, woman, calling everybody's attention, everybody's gaze, they must turn and see this human being that is in their midst. Now, of course, with these stories, as I pray them, as I think on them, I picture them, right? I try and picture this congregation, these people, and what people look like. And I've been sitting and trying to picture this woman. And I got to tell you that this week, that woman has been replaced with an image of a five-year-old boy. Many of you, if not all of you, saw the picture that I saw early in the news this week of a five-year-old boy sitting in an adult-sized chair. Incredibly disconcerting because when we see a child in a chair whose legs are too short to touch the floor, that's an adorable image. So one should not see a child in that position caked with ashes and dirt, blood on their face and arm, causing their hair to just go everywhere with a look of utter shell shock. So the first time I saw that image, click, bye bye I know exactly what that's going to tell me. It's going to tell me there's suffering and horror and violence that I can't fix and solve and deal with. And I just got back from vacation. I don't want to take it in. But then, I hear Jesus say, hey, Ariane, do you see that child? So I go back, maybe later that day, maybe it was the next day, and I click through and I watch the video and I listen and learn his name, Omran. Not 30 minutes ago, I went to the New York Times website and learned that his 10-year-old brother, Ali, had died in that airstrike. And now there's a longer article with many images 
of the children who died in that attack. And it is very hard to take in. But we prayed this thing in our collect this morning. God, help us show forth your power among God's people. We can't do that when we don't let our hearts break. we got to let God in there because that is the compassion that moves us. So I can't fix it. I can't solve it. But I know that back in the spring, members of this community had dinner with some Syrian refugees, with other faith communities. So I know there's something. There's something out there for me to keep praying on and keep calling us as a community to see as we become a community that is part of the repairing and restoring of the breach. But it starts with just acknowledging the grief and the brokenness and seeing it. And that's one of the most important things Jesus is enacting in his faith community on that day. And you know, it's interesting that he doesn't say to the woman, you are healed. Go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus says to this woman, woman, you are set free. Freedom. She is now set free of what is binding her and bending her down. She is free to claim her identity as a daughter of Abraham, a child of God, made worthy in God's eyes, beloved, and made worthy in the eyes of that community where she has been kept on the outside. There's an interview with Archbishop Desmond Tutu I listened to a while back, and he talks about his early years as a bishop in South Africa when there was still apartheid, and he served a small rural parish, and um, most of the members of his parish were domestic workers, and um, apparently the names were too complicated for their white employers to learn. So women were referred to as Annie, men referred to as boys. And Bishop Tutu shares the story of his job on Sunday was to remind those men and women that their name is God Carrier, partner with God. When somebody asks you what your name is, I am a child of God. I am a God bearer. And he said, seeing the women stand up a little straighter at the end of the week, that's what he's supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Empowering people with that worthiness that comes from the knowledge that we are created in the image of God. Seeing the pain, acknowledging the pain, helping people know that they are created in God's image. That prophet Isaiah, that reading, he says, you, 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 you. It's not you, you, and me, you. It's you, plural you. He's saying to the people of God, if you call the Sabbath holy, if you delight in the day of the Lord, then be restorers. Help repair the breaches. And most importantly, remove the yoke. Remove the burdens that have people bending over and tied up. That is our ministry as a faith-filled, light-bearing community. And for all of us, thinking of that in the big ways of our communities in the world, there is that individual reality. Every person here is bound up and burdened by something. Every person has wounds that nobody sees. What do you need to give over to God? What do you need to say, this yoke isn't working for me, it's too heavy? Because Jesus says something about a yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So one other point about this story. <laughs> I find it really interesting and very contemporary that the religious leader 
in this community does not take his complaint to Jesus. First of all, he doesn't even acknowledge the woman. He doesn't even acknowledge this incredible healing that just took place in his congregation. And he doesn't even acknowledge Jesus. Instead, he tries to roundaboutly criticize him. These days you call that triangulation. Perhaps that's a term you're familiar with. Jesus tries to shame the crowd into shaming Jesus by questioning their religiosity. You guys are following religion to the letter of the law. Because for him, that's what the Sabbath is all about. Just another day of burdensome obligations where it's about doing things right versus getting it wrong. And then I am sure this guy thinks of himself as the premier arbiter and judge. God's here, he's here, and he gets to decide who's worthy. It's very sad to me how many people still think that that's the point of religion. It's, it's heartbreaking. That's not the point of religion, to be a bunch of rules that we get right or wrong. That's not life-giving. That's not light-bearing. That's not repairing and restoring us as people or as communities. And I highly doubt that if that poor leader ever saw his reflection in whatever type of mirrors they had back then, I really doubt he saw somebody created in the child as an image, as a child of God, made in the image of God. I think he sees himself and a bunch of people as just simply never measuring up, never measuring up to that code of conduct that is somehow what religion is all about. But we're reminded in Isaiah, we're reminded in Hebrews, although it's a lot more hard to follow, and we're certainly reminded in the gospel. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me. Bless God's holy name. That feeling of completeness and wholeness that we were living into who God created us to be, living into the gifts God gave us to share, that's, that's not a burdensome feeling. That is a life-giving feeling in the flow of that love. And that is what Jesus does in the midst of this community. So they see what it looks like. They see who is deserving and encourages us to go out and do that in the world. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. If we pray that belief on the Sabbath, then we are called to live into that belief when we can and ask God to help us do so. Because we really can go out into the world and proclaim the power of that saving love of God with all people. Amen.